Appearing sometime in the year 1981, a non-branded soda machine appeared in the village of Stonewood, just outside the city of Los Angeles. It was located on the side of a gas station near a high school, a popular location during the weekdays after school would let out as it was just up the street. After the school bell would ring, many groups of kids would come up the hill to grab snacks and drinks from the gas station and hang out in the surrounding area. On Monday, October 12th, 1981, one such group consisted of three high school juniors, Benjamin Hughes, Charlie Burdett, and Dale Brune. The three walked up the hill from Stonewood Senior High School to meet up at their typical spot in the back lot of a foreclosed ice cream shop, stopping at the gas station first to pick up drinks and snacks. It was then that 16-year-old Benjamin Hughes noticed the machine and its lower-priced sodas compared to those inside the store. He pointed this out to his friends, but ultimately he was the only one to purchase anything from the machine. Although he didn't think much of this at the time, he noticed that the four drink options on the machine weren't the names of sodas. Instead, they were simply four different solid colors, red, blue, orange, and black. Not having any particular preference, Ben simply inserted his change, chose the red option, and retrieved his drink. However, another unusual circumstance immediately presented itself. The soda can was unlabeled, completely unlabeled. In fact, the can was completely metallic in appearance. Although this definitely struck Ben as odd, his friend Charlie would later recall that he simply, quote, thought it was some kind of defect from the factory. He showed it to Dee, Brune, and I, and Dee told him it might be worth some money, but that was all we said about it at the time. Looking back, I suppose that was a bad move. The trio continued down the block to the lot behind the ice cream store, where they stayed for the next hour or so, before Ben mentioned feeling nervous and lightheaded to his two friends, and eventually began his mile walk home. The others walked back to Charlie's house. Ben walked inside an hour later, reporting similar symptoms to his mother before heading upstairs to his bedroom, where he crawled into bed and fell asleep. The last time his mother saw him that night was around 10 o'clock p.m. when she checked on him and saw that he was still sleeping. She told Ben that she would call him in sick the following morning and that he should just focus on getting some sleep. Following this conversation, she went to bed herself. When his mother woke up, reportedly at 7.30 the next morning, she noticed that Ben was no longer in bed. This surprised her given that she had told him he didn't have to go into school the next day, but she figured he had felt better and decided to go in anyways. She left for work, not giving it much of a second thought. Around noon, Ben's mother gets a phone call at her place of work. It was the high school. As it turns out, Ben did not show up for his first period attendance after all. She wasn't sure what to think. Perhaps Ben had been in the house after all? She put the school on hold and called her home phone. No answer. She even tried calling the phone numbers of Ben's friends from school, but still, nobody had seen him that morning. She tells the school to call her if they catch wind of where Ben has disappeared to. She gives them the names of his friends so that they can be questioned as to his whereabouts. After being called to the main office, the two friends Ben had been with the afternoon before, Charlie and Dale, reported that neither of them had spoken to him after splitting up. The school they came and went, and still, no sign of Ben. By 3 o'clock that Tuesday afternoon, Ben was declared missing. Now, things start to get strange at this point. After opening Ben's locker searching for any information on where he could have gone to, they find his backpack inside, which his mother recalled Ben bringing inside their home the previous day, meaning he had indeed been inside the building that morning. The following Wednesday at school, the principal came over the intercom after the pledge, asking anyone who had seen Ben at school the previous morning to come forward. And several people did. Two students reported seeing him walking in the hallway. Even more bizarre, another person mentioned seeing him in the bathroom around the same time, running water over his head in the sink. The kid who saw him just left and didn't think much about it at the time, but explained that he looked, quote, detached and frantic, almost like he was in a trance. This was the last noted sighting of Ben. Later in the day, Charlie notified the police about the strange soda machine, mentioning the abnormal bottle and the fact that they usually go by there every single day and had never seen it before. However, when the police showed up at the gas station to find the machine, it was gone. It had seemingly disappeared into thin air, and when the owner of the gas station was questioned about it, he said he didn't put it there, and he didn't even know it had been there in the first place. Wednesday came and went still without any word of Ben. His mother, unable to sleep for obvious reasons, was still awake at 2.15 a.m. on Thursday when she received a phone call. It was Ben. He was crying over the phone, making it hard for his mother to hear him. She implored him to calm down so he could tell her where he was. He explained that about an hour ago, he woke up in the mountains around Mount Gleason, nearly 15 miles away from the school, just off the side of a running trail. 
He found himself to be in seemingly normal shape aside from some sore muscles and intense hunger. However, his confusion had deeply disturbed him. After walking back down the mountain and into a town he had never been to before, he placed the call from a payphone asking an elderly woman for a dime. His mother immediately drove to his location and picked him up. There isn't a doubt in my mind that I was poisoned by whatever the hell was in that can. I don't know why I decided to drink it. I could have gotten myself killed. He recovered shortly after he was found, and although no exact diagnosis could be given, the doctors say it was some sort of dissociative amnesia. Due to a lack of any other evidence, there was really nothing else that could be done, so that was it for a while. That is until the 16th of July, 1983. On that particular Saturday, three college girls, Elizabeth Rowley, Jean Nichols, and Lucille Holliday, decided to go for a day trip down to Virginia Beach from their hometown in the nearby city of Suffolk. After arriving, the girls picked a spot on the beach and stayed out on the sand sunbathing for around an hour and a half before the three of them decided to head to the bathroom. And there, in between the men's and women's bathrooms, sat a soda vending machine. Elizabeth and Jean end up buying two sodas from the machine while waiting for Lucille outside the bathroom. Eventually, the three girls walk back to their spot on the beach and continue tanning in the sun. Sometime later, Jean eventually announces, sounding somewhat fatigued, that she feels like walking along the boardwalk for a bit and that she'd be back in a few minutes. By this point, Elizabeth, the only other girl to have bought one of the sodas, had fallen asleep, and Lucille thought nothing of Jean wanting to go for a walk. But she never came back. When Lucille woke her friend up more than a half hour later to question her about where Jean could have gone, she responded with confusion. She didn't seem to remember how she had ended up at the beach. Lucille notes that she had become extremely delirious. It took her a while to even vaguely gather her thoughts and to understand that they should start looking for Elizabeth. They began by looking for her back at the bathrooms before checking up and down the boardwalk for around a half hour, but ultimately came up empty handed. It was also becoming difficult for Elizabeth to even follow Lucille as her mental state only seemed to be declining. She repeatedly would fall behind, ask to be reminded where they were going, and become distracted by other people or things on the boardwalk. After she completely fell behind and laid down on the ground, Lucille became worried and decided to drive her back home to her mother's house where she could rest. Just like Ben, it seemed that Jean had simply wandered off and disappeared without a trace. After arriving at the house, Lucille drove straight back to the beach to continue searching for her friend. Ultimately, she would call Jean's mother to help search for her daughter along the boardwalk. The two would search the area well into the night, finding no trace of the girl. The two would return back to Elizabeth's house, where the three girls' families would convene to discuss the strange occurrence and to take care of Elizabeth. In an apparent repeat of the Benjamin Hughes case two years earlier, they would eventually decide to contact the police and file a missing persons report to search for the 22-year-old. In the meantime, Elizabeth was admitted to a nearby hospital where they ran some tests and found something nobody had expected to find. At least two drugs were found in her system, the first of which was scopolamine. Ingestion of this chemical is known to have a variety of temporary cognitive defects, namely both short-term and long-term memory loss. According to the National Center for Biotechnology Information, or NCBI, scopolamine, a well-recognized... I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that. Drug is commonly used as a standard drug for the experimental purpose to induce cognitive deficits in animals. Administration of scopolamine produces deficits on tests of visual recognition memory, visuospatial praxis, verbal recall, visuospatial recall, psychomotor speed, and visual perceptual function, and causes impairment in learning and memory in a dose-dependent manner. The other drug found within Elizabeth's body was phencyclidine, better known as PCP or angel dust. Again, citing the NCBI, hallmark clinical findings of PCP intoxication are nystagmus, hypertension, and a mental status which is often described as a dissociative anesthesia. Now, although these findings were shocking to those who were worried about Elizabeth, they were essential in finally beginning to piece together exactly what was going on. When questioned by the police following the filing of Jean's missing persons report, the soda machine near the bathrooms was mentioned, and it was then that the dots finally began to connect. Although Lucille hadn't purchased any soda herself, she did take note of the strange design of the cans, or perhaps the lack thereof. Yes, as you have probably already pieced together, these were the exact same soda cans described in the Benjamin Hughes case in 1981. Lucille recalled the machine's strange appearance, detailing that it, quote, almost appeared to have been hastily modified and rebranded. Some outer panels of the machine appeared to have been removed and replaced with unstained wood, with some kind of strange logo appearing on the front. I wish I could remember it in more detail, but I simply hadn't paid the machine much attention at the time. 
cross-examining this description with the descriptions given by Benjamin, as well as other confirmed similarities through Elizabeth's questioning, such as the strange solid-colored buttons on the machine, revealed that it was, indeed, the same exact soda machine seen in Stonewood, California. And yes, that means that somebody had trekked this thing all the way from Southern California all the way to Virginia Beach. That's more than 2,500 miles, all the way across the entire continental United States. Immediately after making this discovery, the Virginia Beach Police Department attempted to confiscate the machine given the location specified by Lucille and Elizabeth following her recovery. However, to their horror, it had again disappeared. Just as sporadically as it had showed up, it had vanished. The same exact scenario had been allowed to occur again. Whoever was doing this was deliberately trying to harm people, before swiftly erasing any trace of their presence. Complicating matters even more, two weeks had passed and Jean was still completely gone, wiped off the face of the earth without a single lead. Something very sinister was going on, and the motive was still unclear. We still didn't know who was putting this machine out, why they were putting it out, and what their goal was in trying to poison innocent people. Local police departments across the country were notified of the repeat occurrence, were made aware of the threat, and were instructed to confiscate the machine and or soda cans as soon as possible if they caught wind of another attempted poisoning. Luckily, it seemed that the soda machine did not attract much appeal from potential victims. The machine did not even seem to appear like a vending machine at all based on the descriptions given. This appeared to result in only two known poisonings from the machine before it had been quickly removed from the area by the perpetrator. Elizabeth would soon make a full recovery thanks to the medical attention she received. However, Jean, horrifyingly, was never found. Many different theories have been proposed about where she could have gone. Some suspect that she may have swam out into the water and drowned due to the effects of the drugs. Others speculate that she was kidnapped by whoever was setting up this machine. It was as though the earth had opened up and swallowed the poor girl whole. It was around this point that the story entered a sort of standstill. Virtually no new evidence had come forward in the following three years, and the machine hadn't been spotted anywhere within the United States since that day in July of 1983 at Virginia Beach. Although the story attracted some media attention at the time, its lack of development caused the events to fade into obscurity from the public eye. That is, until the final related case. On August 3rd, 1986, Casey Jones, a middle school math teacher working out of Roswell, New Mexico, was driving down United States Highway 285 when he happened to glance out of the passenger side window of his Ford pickup truck to see a man lying on the ground unconscious, just off the side of the road. He immediately pulled over, exited his vehicle, and went to check on the man. He was unresponsive, but he was breathing and his heart was still beating. Mind you, the highway runs through an extremely barren desert, and judging by the intense heat that day, this was no place to be in the middle of nowhere without a vehicle. To Jones, it was clear that the man was suffering from a heat stroke and required immediate medical attention. Although he was already 24 miles out from Roswell, it was still the closest location to where the man could receive help, so he dragged the unresponsive man from where he lay all the way to the side of the highway, loaded him into the back seat of his Ram 1500, and returned to Roswell, where the man was admitted to Lovelace Regional Hospital, where his condition slowly returned to stable. On his person was a dark green backpack, which, upon inspection, contained a small amount of money, mostly in quarters and dimes, a copy of Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions, several smaller bags which appeared to have at one point contained food, as well as... three metallic, unmarked soda cans. Two of which were empty, and one of which was still full. The man in question was a 41-year-old local named Michael Hawkins a man known by a handful of locals living in Roswell to offer kindness and friendship to anyone who was willing to strike up a conversation with him. He was, for lack of a better term, homeless. Despite his financial circumstances, he was known to work odd jobs and other gigs to support himself however he could, living an almost nomadic lifestyle within the city. He remained unconscious for some time after being brought back through intravenous hydration therapy. Although Hawkins was not tested for the two drugs that had been known to be present in the soda cans, after he awoke and explained his story, the connection became apparent. After his recovery, Michael explained that after consuming a can of soda he had purchased from a vending machine which sat on the side of a beauty salon, he quickly began to notice a sense of detachment from his surroundings, which he initially attributed to possible blood sugar spike from the soda. He also recalls the same strange compulsion to wander as the other victims of the soda poisonings mentioned, which is how he believes he ended up in the desert. 
He vaguely recalls walking down Highway 285, which runs directly through the center of the city, before finding himself following along a metal chain-link fence somewhere in the outskirts of the city. He does remember the intense dread and thirst he eventually felt after finding himself completely alone in the middle of the desert. He does not remember consuming the second drink. Michael also recalls the strange homemade look of the machine as well as the four different color-coded options. This served to corroborate both the descriptions given by the girls on Virginia Beach in 1983 as well as the, albeit limited, description by Benjamin Hughes in 1981. At this point, I'm sure you could have already guessed the machine wasn't there when they went to check on it. However, upon police questioning of the owner of the beauty salon, an interesting development was made. Although the owner of the store didn't have any information on the machine, a teenage hairdresser chimed in during the police investigation inside the salon. She had seen who dropped the machine off. Apparently, this was all the work of an older looking man, sporting a straggly black beard, brown baseball cap, white tank top with some sort of graphic on the back, black shorts, and tan boots. The girl described the man as appearing strange, and that she witnessed him rolling the machine off the back of a white pickup truck using two long planks of wood. Apparently this occurred sometime around dawn, just as she was coming in for work. She described his actions as purposeful and swift. When she first noticed him, he was setting up the wooden ramp, and within a minute, he had already unloaded the machine, plugged it in via an outdoor electrical socket, loaded the ramp back up, and had begun to pull away. It appeared to be a routine he was familiar with, a set of actions he had performed many times before. Despite someone actually seeing the perpetrator in person, sadly, the hairstylist didn't see his face and little could be done to track him down. This was the final documented appearance of the soda machine. After making the 2,500 mile trek from Southern California to Virginia Beach, it then apparently made a 1,600 mile return journey to the Western United States being dropped in New Mexico. Now, several factors make this case extremely terrifying. First is the total lack of information. I mean, there was such little information there. I mean, we know kind of what it looked like. We know kind of what was in there, but other than that, there's really very little information on this. Because of that, there was such little action that could be taken. I mean, this guy could still be out there. It could have been multiple people. There could have been different kinds of drinks. We don't know. Second is the extremely bizarre combination of drugs. Although the presence of phencyclidine and scopolamine were confirmed, it isn't clear if these two drugs alone could have caused that strange compulsion to wander. There may have been something else. Due to the lack of evidence and the complete disappearance of the machine after August 1986, it's very likely that this mystery will never be solved. <laughs>